Good morning, everyone. Oh, Rick was just saying it gives him goosebumps. Wow, it still gives me goosebumps and it's been 15 years. Can you believe it? Oh, don't do the calculation on how old they said I was, please. I've got to delete that out of that video eventually. As soon as I hit the big 5-0, I will. Um, oh, I, was, I normally come up on stage and I yell out, Aussie, 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 and get everyone to do it. Do you want to wake up with, with a bit of noise? Yeah? Yeah? Aussie, Aussie, Aussie! Oh, come on. Oh, for those of you who don't know what to do, you go, oi, oi, oi. Okay? Try it again. Aussie. <laughs> Some of them were going, uh, uh, uh. Okay, you ready? Aussie, Aussie, Aussie. <laughs> that was amazing. I should take you back home because that was louder than I get back in Sydney. Believe me, it was. Um, but first of all, look, I just want to say thank you for you guys coming this morning. I know that um, it was a long day yesterday. Who was out last night? Anyone out last night? A <laughs> few hands are going like this. How much sleep did we get last night? Eight hours? Hands up if you got eight hours sleep. Oh, a few people. Seven? Six? Oh, a lot of six. Five? Four? Oh, three? <laughs> Not pointing at anyone. Two? Oh, two. Scott got two. And he did a great presentation this morning for, uh, uh, for Infusionsoft. I forgot the name already there. It was, oh. Yeah, I was uh, still waking up. I was up at about probably 3.30 this morning, and I've been up since then, still trying to get rid of the uh, jet lag. But first of all, um, I just want to say, while I was lying awake, I was thinking, you know what, I'm just incredibly grateful, inc incredibly grateful that this amazing company has flown me across the world to share my story with you guys this morning. So I just want to thank um, NPE for bringing me out here. It's really special to come out here because 20 years ago, I came here, and this is pretty much where, in San Diego, where my beach volleyball career began. And I trained here for two months before the 96 Olympic Games. So thank you, San Diego, for, for putting on the great weather back then. But it's really great to be back here. Um, what I normally do when I begin as well is, is try and paint the picture of what it's like to win an Olympic gold medal but to not only win one, but to win one at home, not only in your home country, but in your home state. I come from Sydney, I live in Sydney. I didn't grow up there, but I've lived a lot of my life there. And I won the gold medal in my home state. How cool was that? How amazing was that timing for my athletic career? And I wanna share this picture with you. This was actually the moment that I realised the impact of how this was going to affect me in Australia, having won an Olympic gold medal in my home state. And it, and it looks a bit odd, it's just a crowd of people, but Natalie and I are standing there in the middle of that crowd, and it's just in the back streets of Bondi Beach. Now, this was about maybe two hours after the gold medal. The first thing you do when you win a medal, and actually the first thing you do when you are in any Olympic final, is a drug test after the match. You go into a little room, you literally have to pee in a little cup, and you have to give a sample, you have to give enough of a sample for them to get the testing done, right? So after an hour and a half of volleyball, there's not a lot of fluid left in your body, as you can imagine. So the first thing we do when we walk in this room is guzzle down a couple of bottles of water so we can get the, the fluid flowing through. Then we sit there and wait about half an hour and they go, yep, I'm ready now, and we give our sample. Because if you don't give enough, if you don't have enough pee in that cup, you have to wait there for hours, and we wanted to get out and celebrate. So we had our water, and then Channel 7 was the, the network that was doing the interview, and they wanted to, to, to get us away from the beach. There was too much going on down near the stadium, so they took us into this side street to do this interview. It was a, a live interview to the nation, the first time we'd ever done one live to the nation. And uh, there we were standing there with the TV crew, and all the, the people from the houses in that street came out, and they're all surrounding us. And all of a sudden, we're about 10 minutes, 15 minutes out, and that water that I drank <laughs> was starting to make its way through my system. And I'm standing there waiting and I'm thinking, I'm not going to make it. I need to find a bathroom. And we're standing in the side streets. And I looked around and I thought, surely someone here has a house. So I looked at this lady and said, excuse me, have you got a house around here? And she said, yeah, just across the road. I said, can I quickly go and use your bathroom? She said, yes, come with me. And we ran across the street. And I got into her house, went to the bathroom, and the moment I realised what 
it was going to be like having won an Olympic gold medal, medal in my home state, my home country, was when I walked out of that bathroom, she looked up at me and she said, oh, I'm never going to wash my bathroom again. <laughs> And I swear to God, that was the moment I went, oh my God, I'm famous. This is, this is so cool. Um, but yeah, it was pretty cool. And I'm just so grateful that I can now share, um, I guess, the stories and the, the gifts that I've, I've learned, the things that I've learned along the way. Because at the end of the day, it's not just the gold medal. It's who you become. It's, it's, it is the journey. And you hear it all the time. It's not about, you know, the, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. It's about the journey. But it actually really is. It's who I've become and what I've learnt from that journey. And I'm going to share that with you today. But to, to fill the picture in, to see where I started, I actually started by playing indoor volleyball. Um, knee pads, socks, smelly socks, shoes playing on the hard floorboards. I actually fell into sport by accident. I was already six foot tall at the age of 15. I was teased for being six foot tall, you know, so I was quite a, a, a shy, you know, skinny, tall, gangly young lady, lady. Um, and at the time, I, sport was fun, but I wasn't, I didn't have this kind of vision of going to the Olympics, like Natalie, for instance. Natalie Cook, my beach volleyball partner, she swam when she was young and she saw the Olympics on TV at the age of 10 years old and thought, I want to be in the Olympics one day, and that was her dream. But I hadn't had that dream yet. I kind of fell into sport by accident because my brother came home from school one day and he said, Kerry, we've got this game of volleyball. We need six people to stand on the court when the whistle blows. He said, once it's blown, can you just step out of the way so we can play the point? Him and his mates. And I thought, you know what, I'll do that for you. Plus, I liked a couple of his friends. They were quite cute. So I thought, I'll go to the recreation centre and I'll stand on the court, I'll help him out. And that was how I was introduced to sport. So you never quite know when the next thing, the next passion that you might develop in life is going to come up. It could be just around the corner. So I went out that night and I played and I actually stayed on the court and I hit the ball a couple of times and my brother said, wow, you know, you're six foot tall, you're, you're reasonably coordinated, maybe you could play this sport. And he invited me to his club team and then the coaches saw me and went, oh, come and play. We, you know, we really like tall girls and we'll teach you how to play the sport. And they're patting me on the back for being tall for the first time in my life. Normally I was being teased and now I'm being patted on the back. So I grew more confidence, my, confident, my shoulders went back. And I thought, oh, I like this. And so I stayed, I stayed on the court. And then the state team coaches said, come and play in the state team and then come and play in the national team. And all of a sudden I was wearing green and gold and I was traveling around the world as an 18 year old representing Australia in indoor volleyball. And it was just amazing. And I did that over the next 10 years. I studied a little bit, I worked a little bit. I didn't go to university. Shame on me, I didn't get to university because I was playing sport. I was at the University of Sport and Life. And I learned so much on that, tra oh, that journey and, and during that travel. But that 10 years, it taught me a lot, but it all came down to one moment that completely changed my life. It got to the point where I was one of the best players in the country. And I'd played internationally as well. I'd played professionally in Italy. And I was at the national championships in Melbourne. I was representing New South Wales. And I was, I was on the right-hand side of the court and I was just about to spike this ball straight down the line. And at the last minute, I changed my mind and I went, I'm going to hit it this way. And I still almost remember that moment, being in the air, having that quick decision change. And as I hit it, that ball was blocked. And as that ball landed, I thought, I'll get that. I landed, I twisted, full force. My total body went this way, but my foot stayed facing that way. And I completely ruptured my cruciate ligament. I completely ruptured my medial ligament. I wrecked all my meniscus and my cartilage. Do you think I did a pretty good job of, of destroying my knee? Yeah, my right knee, pretty good job. 10 years, I'd barely even sprained a finger. I don't think I'd even had a sprained ankle in that time. No injury that I could even remember. So I did it all in one action. And over the next three months, I was sitting on the couch a lot. I basically had my leg up. I couldn't let my leg go down. I had two surgeries at that point. Couldn't let my leg go down behind, uh, below hip level because the blood would rush into the wound and it would get really, really painful. And over the next 
a few months, I lost 10 kilos, which is, how much is that? That's about 20, yeah, 25 pounds or more. It was a lot of weight. I lost a lot of weight, muscle, obviously, a lot of muscle. Even my, even my face became really hollow. It was just awful, and I became quite depressed. And as you, as you can imagine, 10 years I'd been doing what I love, representing Australia, traveling around the world with all my friends and you know, everybody I knew was all volleyball now. It was all about volleyball. That was my life. And then all of a sudden that carpet was ripped out from underneath me. Well, it was funny because I was, I really, uh, no one told me that I couldn't play again, but I kind of had that in the back of my head. And my boyfriend at the time, he knew that. He was a teacher and he came home one day and he gave me this, a volleyball. No writing on it, just a brand new white spanking volleyball. And the first thing I did when I unwrapped it was start crying. I thought, what am I going to do with this? I can't even walk yet. What am I going to do with this? He said, Kerry, on every panel of the ball, I want you to write a goal. And then I want you to date that goal and then bit by bit get back to playing volleyball again and then playing for Australia. Now, I was 27 years old. I'd never written a goal down in my life. I kind of knew what I wanted to do, but I'd never written it down, let alone put a date on something. So I got a marker out, I got the ball, I didn't have anything else to do, I was sitting there, pretty boring. I got the ball, I got a marker, and I started filling it in, and I thought, okay, they get, I'll get the stitches out in January. Back then we had the stitches mainly on the outside. <laughs> stitches, what are stitches? We don't have stitches anymore. Oh yeah, we have little ones. But this wound, I mean, I had a, um, an incision that was probably six inches long. And I knew that everything would be okay to go in the water by January. So I thought the first thing I would do is put a float belt on and just get in the water and move my leg. And then I thought, okay, well, after that, I'll be able to just do little hops in the water. And then I thought, okay, after that, I'll be able to jog. Won't I? <laughs> Who's had a knee injury? Anyone had a knee injury? When does jogging come along? Yeah, a year later. The funny thing is, at the time, because I'd never had an injury, I had no idea how to do rehabilitation. I had no idea what the steps were going to be to get better and get me back on the court. So I just started filling it in willy-nilly, thinking, OK, I'll be able to do this, I'll be able to do that, I'll put a date on it, let's just see how we go. So that was the first step. In February, he came, came home, he said, what are, you, what are you doing this month? And I said, well, riding a bike. That's what it says on the ball. That's what I'm supposed to be able to do. So he went out and he got the bike out of the shed, dusted off all the cobwebs and the dirt that had collected. He made me get on that bike. I remember ha having a dress on or something. I said, get on that bike and just ride it up and down the driveway to help me complete that goal. That's pretty cool. So the first thing there is, Put it out there. Let people know what you're trying to achieve because you, you just don't know who's going to be able to help you. Who here has actually got a goal? I'm sure you probably have. You've been asked to write a few things. Everybody, keep your hand up. Keep your hand up, nice and high. Keep your hand up if you look at it once a month. Once a week. Once a day. Ooh. That's fantastic, that's really awesome. And I'm not surprised because you're all entrepreneurs. That's fantastic. Normally in a corporate group, everybody's hands down by their sides by about once a week, but once a day. Those people once a day, can I just, can I ask you where do you um, keep your goals? Where do you write them? Three places, every morning she writes her task list and her goals and puts them in her pockets. How cool is that? How often do you get them out each day? 17 times a day. 17 times? You must have your hands in your pockets. Do you any, do anything during the day? Just walk around? <laughs> no, that's fantastic. Who else? That's awesome. Yeah, where do you keep yours? I've got like a vision board. Vision board? See it every day? Fantastic. Who else? Anything different? Yeah. A planner, so you look at it every day when you see what you've, you've got to do that day. Anything else that's really different? Yeah? On the mirror in the bathroom. I love that one. So when you're grooming your hair. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a long time to do my hair. 
Takes a long time to do his hair. I didn't say that, he did. <laughs> yeah, awesome. So what do you write it in? Like, not, you don't use a permanent marker, I hope. Like a little card and you stick it up. Fantastic. Anybody else? Yeah. Cover on your phone? Yeah, 30 or 40 times a day, he sees his, the picture on the cover on his phone. Awesome. Anything else? I've heard of, yeah? On your wall? At home or at work? At work, so you're looking at it all day. Fantastic. So it's about keeping it out there in front of you and reminding you. You know, if I didn't have that ball, I wouldn't be standing here today. I can pretty much guarantee you that. Because every single day, I was, it was rem, a memory, a reminder of what I had to achieve to get to the next step. I've heard of people having them on their, um, their sun visor. So when it gets sunny and they turn their visor down, oh, there's my goals. Our success coach had us write our top three goals on a little piece of paper. He had them laminated and we put them in our wallet. Because every day you go to, the wallet, go to your wallet and while you're handing over your credit card or you, you're waiting for change, you just pull it out and have a look. It's about creating that vision and reminding yourself each day because we're so busy, aren't we? We've got those spinning plates that Scott was talking about. We've got lots of spinning plates going on and we're trying to like, juggle everything. And sometimes our goals and dreams, we just forget about them because we're doing the day-to-day -day stuff. The, um, the other thing about this ball, on the bottom there's a valve. And there was a blank spot on the bottom because I thought I'll, I won't fill that in because I'll sit the ball on the valve and that's how I'll just display it. Now eventually I thought, no, nah, look, this seems like there's something missing. I felt like I had to fill the whole ball in because I kind of put all things about volleyball and then playing for Australia again. So I turned it over one day and I got a red marker out. Most of it was black, but I got a red one out as well. And I wrote, hmm, I thought, what can I do after playing for Australia again in indoor volleyball? I thought, maybe I'll try beach volleyball. I thought that would be harder to play on my knees than indoor. I'd never really played it. So I wrote beach volleyball. It was 1993 when I filled this ball out. And they just announced that the next Olympic Games here in the United States, in Atlanta in 1996, would have beach volleyball as a full medal sport. So I wrote in really tiny letters, just in case somebody would see it, <laughs> Beach Volleyball, Atlanta, United States, 1996. And I wrote that on the ball and then I quickly turned it back over <laughs> and I left it there. Now over the months I tried to get back and bit by bit I tried to rehabilitate and eventually after 12 months I realised that it's just too hard, isn't it? It's just too hard on your knee joints, the, the hard floorboards that we play on, the court. So I tried beach volleyball, and lo and behold, I realised that this was really good on my joints. And so I got myself a pair of purple leopard skin bikinis. <laughs> that picture was actually taken here in uh, the United States. I think that was in uh, Hermosa Beach. I think, isn't that... It almost looks like good stuff. Oh, yeah, it is. It's stuff. Good stuff down at Hermosa Beach. Does anyone know that restaurant down there? Yeah. There's an AVP event that we were allowed to play. And um, I started playing beach volleyball. It was amazing. All of a sudden, I was in a team of two. So much better than being in a team of 12 and having to worry about all these other women and their issues and their emotions and their problems. <laughs> now I had just one person to worry about. And she was a handful enough, no. But I actually started out playing with a different girl. I started playing with my best friend. Her name was Annette, my best friend. And she and I did really, really well. And we, we played our first ever world tour event in Florida, in Miami, Florida, in 1994. And we did okay. We, we beat a Brazilian team. They had a really early game against us. They were still half half asleep from the night before. They didn't think that we were any chop and they came out, oh, it's Australia. Oh. And then we beat them and they were like, oh, what happened? And that's when I realised that I could be good at this sport. I thought maybe that dream on the bottom of that ball could become a reality. I thought maybe I've got a chance. And then I went, oh, the girl that I'm playing with, my best friend, she's probably not the best partner I could choose. Maybe she's not going to get me there. And I had to make a really big decision. I had to decide whether to dump my best friend and take away her possible opportunity of going to the Olympics and pick up a girl by the name of Natalie Cook, 10 years younger than me, but really rising fast in the sport. 
and really upset my best friend. I thought, what am I going to do? And I actually asked people all around me. I asked all our coaches, I asked other players, I asked our federation. Everybody said to me, don't do that. Don't risk what's already going well. Don't change. Don't take a risk. You know, stay with that just in case. But somewhere in my heart, I thought, you know what? No, there's got to be something better. It's not going to get me to where I want to go. So I took that risk. And I'm so glad I took that risk. I had to dump my best friend. She didn't talk to me for two years after that. Had to dump her and start playing with Natalie Cook. Well, of course, you know, the rest is history in that sense. But the point is, have a think about who is in your team right now? Who is in your immediate surrounding? Who is in your business? Who are you in a relationship with? Who are you sitting next to? Are these people the people that are going to help you get to where you really want to go? Are these people going to support you and be there and fight for you? and be positive and uplift you and empower you to reach your dreams? Are they? Because perhaps you need to make some changes, perhaps. And if they are, fantastic, you're in the right place. If they're not, get them off the bus, get the right people on the bus so you can get to your destination. So Natalie and I went along together, we started playing and very quickly, we, we rose in the rankings on the world tour. We spent a lot of time here. Thank you very much for having us and teaching us how to play the sport in this country. We spent a lot of time here and we made it to the 1996 Olympic Games. First time walking in the village in Atlanta. Did you know that McDonald's was a sponsor of the Atlanta Olympics? Does that make you cringe a little bit now? They had about 17 outlets or something in the, in the village, all these little pokey boxes where they just, you know, they had salads, they figured, oh, it's the Olympics, we'll just introduce salad and fruit juice. Great. We didn't go there until after. Everybody was in there after their events, just going, oh, Big Macs, fries. But most people obviously avoided it in the lead up to their events. But these places were incredible. Has anyone been in an Olympic village? couple of people, yeah. They're pretty amazing, aren't they? It's just like, it, it is like a village. They call it a village because it's got everything in there that you need, all the facilities that you need. And then people walking down the streets in this village and in the food halls with names on their track suits, names on their back that you've never even heard of. These strange countries and you're like, where's that country? I don't even know how to say it, let alone know where it is. Hundreds of them. And you see in the food hall, you see the weightlifters come in with their you know, two plates of, uh, two trays of, you know, plates of meat and potatoes and all the breads and everything because they're just all stacking on weight. And then you see the gymnasts with their little tray and one plate of salad. <laughs> and they sit down next to their Soviet Union coach and their coach is eyeing off how much salad they've got, you know, just in case they put on any weight. It's quite incredible. I'd sit in there for hours and just talk to people, try and talk to people. I loved it. It was actually in Atlanta that I realised how important it was going to be for my future to be a really good role model in sport because I looked up to a particular athlete and her name was Monica Sellis. I'd never met her, but I really admired the way after she came back from the stabbing, remember that, she got stabbed, in the back and how she came back, the courage that she showed to come back and play again and compete. And I, I just saw her one day in, this, in the village. I'm like, oh my God, there's Monica Sellis. I've, you know, in my head, I just had this real thing about her. And I, I'm not the type of person to ever ask for an autograph, but I seriously had to get her autograph. So I went up to her and she had quite a few people around her and poor thing, she probably just wanted to eat a lunch or something. But I, I had an Australian flag with me and I thought, I've got to get an autograph on this flag. And I, I kind of lined up almost behind a couple of other people and I gave it to her and I said, hi, I'm just after you. Oh. And, then, and she just went. <clears throat> that was it. That was my experience of Monica Sellers. And from that day on, I don't like her that much anymore. And <laughs> But from that day on, I made it a thing that any time anybody spoke to me as an athlete, and I hadn't won a medal yet, any time anyone spoke to me, any child, any adult, I would make it a point of making sure that person left with a good impression of me because I knew I was going to be a role model. I just, I just had this sense. 
So in Atlanta, we were ranked number six, and we had a goal in Atlanta. Our goal was to win a medal, a medal. That's a pretty good goal, win a medal. So quarterfinal, you all know how quarterfinals work. The winners go into the semis. We had to play USA, best team in the States. The team that they said was going to probably win the gold medal. And we had them in the quarter. Bad draw. We had an outside court. We're on court two. So we didn't have the biggest crowd, but we had a big crowd. And everybody's just chanting, USA, USA. And Natalie's dad's in the corner going, Ozzy, Ozzy, Ozzy. Oi, oi, oi. <laughs> Couldn't even hear him. And somehow, like, it was a tough game, but emotionally, but somehow we got through and we beat the team. Sorry, we beat you in the quarterfinal. Not you, but, you know, your team. And it was a pretty amazing thing because, wow, we're really now in for a chance of winning a medal. That's our goal, to win a medal. We're in the semi-final. And we had to play a Brazilian team the next day in the semi-final. It was a number two Brazil team, so it wasn't their strongest team. We'd beaten them quite a few times. So we had a really good chance because, as you know, you win the semi, you get into the final, that's gold or silver, guaranteed. But then we started to think, what happens if we lose the semi? Ooh, we could come fourth. <laughs> we could come fourth. What happens if we lose? We could come fourth. Fourth, 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 fourth. And a head just started to fill and fill and fill with all the negative things, all the things that could go wrong. And we stepped out on that court. I don't know what was going on. I don't know where I was. I was obviously on Mars because 15 minutes it took and they absolutely thrashed us. Thrashed us like we'd never lost to them before. And we'd beaten this team before because we were completely focused on what happens if we lose, don't lose. How many times have you been focused on the worst possible scenario? Yeah, be honest. And what happened? Did it happen, generally? Because what you focus on is what happens to you. So it was just such a massive lesson that we learnt that afternoon. We didn't realise it till months later, because all we could think of after coming back from that match was, what are we going to do tomorrow? We're in the bus on the way back to the village. Natalie's chin was on her chest. She couldn't literally not look us in the eye, myself and our coach. And she just, she was really depressed. And I don't know why, she thought it was all her fault, and it kind of was, but... <laughs> no, it wasn't really, just kidding. Um, but she was really bad, and we thought, okay, now she loves a massage. She loves being looked after. We said, go and have a massage. Go in the massage hall. Go in the rooms with all the other um, athletes, the Australian athletes, and get looked after, and then come out and we'll have our meeting for tomorrow to try and play off for the bronze medal. So she walks into this massage room. Normally it's just like humming with athletes coming in, getting their rub downs, getting stretched, getting taped, and they've got doctors and physiotherapists and chiropractors and osteopaths and nurses and everything. This is just the Aussie area. They've got everybody to look after you. She walks in. Empty. It's empty. There's no one in there, not even a therapist. All the tables are empty. She's like, where is everyone? She's about to start bawling. And just around the corner, she hears this noise and she thinks, what's everyone doing over there? She looks over. They're all crowded around this TV set. Because that night, swimming in the men's 1500 metre freestyle final was an Australian by the name of Kieran Perkins. Now, Kieran Perkins was a pretty hot swimmer. He'd won a gold medal in the 1500 metre at the previous Olympics in 92, and he came back and he was hoping to do it again in 96. However, he'd only just got into the final by one one hundredth of a second, like just by a fraction. So he was in lane eight, and that's the little lane where you get all the wash and the pee from all the swimmers that are up ahead. It's <laughs> the worst lane in the pool. Lane eight, so there they were standing around the TV set and they're all going, oh, we'll just watch this. Kieran's not going to win. Yeah, he's lucky he made the final. Good on him for making the final. All the athletes and the therapists and the media or even the commentators were even saying that as well. But there was one person that believed in Kieran that night. Who do you think that was? Kieran, exactly. So Kieran stood there on, in lane eight. I think this is the left lane, isn't it? 
your left, oh, it's my left now, lane eight. He stood there and they stood there and they were watching around this TV set. The gun went off, Kieran dove in. He didn't want any of that pee in that wash, so he just took off like a torpedo. And he was in front from the start and everyone's going, oh, look, Kieran's in front. Oh, look, oh, look. And they're all getting, they're all really happy. And then all of a sudden he's still in front and he's still in front and lap after lap after lap. And the adrenaline's just building and building and Natalie's just getting into it. And everyone's screaming and yelling and slapping and high-fiving. And then he eventually hits the wall and he wins the gold medal from lane eight. How'd you be? Isn't that amazing? And they stood there. And I tell you what, that was the best thing that happened for Natalie Cook that night and for me and our team. She was so inspired by that win. And what that means to me is that sometimes when we're at our lowest, when we think that there's nothing else we can do in this world to lift ourselves up again, just open your eyes. Look at all the inspiration around us. You know, who reads great books? Inspirational books. I hope a lot of us do, but we should. There's books, there's videos, there's movies, there's music. This morning I was looking through Facebook and one of my friends put... Um, a video of this kid at a, a probably a college basketball game here in the States. I didn't read which college it was, a little overweight kid. And he was doing like a, a rapping dance to Happy. You know that song, come on, get happy. Da, 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 da. You know, and he was going off and it was the best. I actually wrote on there, you just made my day because it was just the best thing. It made me feel amazing. So next time you're feeling down here, nothing's going right, just listen to some music or something. Look around for some inspiration. There's people here in this room that have amazing stories and you're lucky to hear them and be part of this community. But sometimes as females, I don't know, boys probably do it too. You know when we have relationships break breakups? Why is it that we listen to sad songs? We do that, don't, I, don't we? And we just go, oh, <laughs> more sad songs. Let's cry some more. Why do we do that? Why don't we just listen to happy and feel good and then attract all the guys again? Wouldn't that be great? So, you know, sometimes we just forget. We just forget. It's all around us. So the next day we came out. Luckily, we had a meeting. Natalie's all pumped up again. And we thought, right, how are we going to beat the team? You know who we had to play for the bronze medal? USA again, their number two team. But they were good, they were really good. I remember our coach going through with a, a board and all the stats and the strategy and he was drawing lines and she can hit it here and here and here and here. And I'm going, oh my God, it's full. How are we gonna play defense? She hits it everywhere. We actually had an agreement because he gave us this strategy and we said, no, we don't think we should do that. We should do this. And he's like, he was a pretty good coach. He was switched on because he said, okay, you can do your strategy for the first five points. If it's not working, you switch to mine. And we thought, cool, we'll show him. <laughs> well, it didn't work, we switched to his. <laughs> but luckily, he was really good about it, because if he made us do his, probably wouldn't have worked as well. But we went out there, and everyone's yelling out, USA, USA, this is a bronze medal match. And Natalie's dad was really drowned out by this stage. And all of a sudden, we sat down for a time out, and Natalie sat down next to me, and I said to her, Nat, oh, I said, this is really starting to get to me, all this chanting. And she just looked at me. She's 21 years old, so pretty, pretty like, powerful for that young. She looked at me, and she said, Kez, calls me Kez, turn the letters around. USA, USA. What can that also stand for? Yeah, A U, yeah, Rick, A U S, A U S. And that's what I, the first thing I did was laugh because I got it. A U S, U S A. The first thing I thought was, oh, you're crazy. I laughed. We had some fun. It kind of relaxed the situation. Went back out on the court. We looked at each other. They started up the chanting. And then we started singing with the music and every, with their chant. But we were going, A U S, A U S. And everyone's getting louder. And we're just going, A U S. It was perfect. It totally distracted us. So we learned that it doesn't matter what happens to you, it's how you choose to respond. Isn't that true? You know, you could wake up this morning after two hours sleep, three hours sleep and go, oh God, I feel terrible. I've got to sit down all day. Or you could get up and go, well, you know what? I didn't have enough sleep, but I'm gonna have a fantastic day. You know, that your, it's your choice how you respond. 
So after all the USA and the AUSs, we did come out of that game pretty well. And as you know, because I've already told you, we came home with this one. And this is from 1996. Thank you. Thank you. It's quite shiny, isn't it? It almost looks gold, doesn't it? We did these welcome home parades when we got back to Australia. We went around the country. It was just a big party, really. And, um, you know, showing off our medals. And people would come running up to us going, wow, you've won a gold medal, because it was so shiny. And we'd have to go, no, nah, it's only a bronze. But I tell you what, that was the first time that I went, right, I'm going to turn this into gold. So I hand that one around. Who wants to have a look? Do you want to have a look? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Please be careful with it. Oh! oh <laughs> Don't bite it, okay? No biting. You can take photos, take selfies, make sure you tag me. Find me on Facebook or Twitter, yeah. Oh yeah, oh God, he's got his phone out, he's going for it. What, now? Or later? Maybe later. Maybe later. Everyone said, oh, later. You can turn around and sort of, I can be in the background. Be really creative and go, here she is up there. <laughs> So after Atlanta, I don't know if you picked it up in the opening video, um, Natalie and I, yeah, we were doing okay, but things weren't doing as well as we wanted them to, to be doing. So we decided to split up for a, what we thought was going to be forever. It's like a relationship. We're like, you know, it's your fault. No, it's your fault. No, you're bad. No, no, you're bad. So we started arguing all the time, and we, we split up, and we actually played with different partners for a year. And it was the best thing, again, that could ever happen. So sometimes a change is all that you need to sort of work out that what you have is actually really special. She went and played with a younger partner, and I played with a girl that was around my age and my experience, so I kind of stepped back from being the big sister, and Natalie stepped up. And then all of a sudden, after about a year, she was working with a guy that she met, an American guy. A lot of Americans feature in our story. Um, an American guy, who, he'd moved out from LA, he was an actor. He'd been in 52 movies, I should get some pictures of him. His name's Kirik Ashley. You probably won't remember him because he was always the bad guy in the background. So he was, with, he was in movies with Chuck Norris and Sylvester Stallone and all those type of guys. And um, he was kind of, he, bald head, sorry I looked straight at you then, bald head. <laughs> <laughs> you too Josh. I don't think you could get out of it. Um, bald head, like tattoos, he had chunky jewellery, big, strong, muscular guy, like the last guy that you want to bring back to your National Federation and say, hey, can we have some funding to work with this dude? Um, but Natalie actually met him in a seminar. He was giving a personal development seminar in Australia because he wasn't in acting, but one day he had an accident on set and one of his best friends died in a helicopter crash. It was quite tragic. And from that point on, he really started to evaluate his life and he was already interested in personal training and he used to do work with um, Tony Robbins. So he learned how to do, conduct firewalks. So he thought, I could do this. And he came to Australia to pursue that as a career. And Natalie met him at a firewalk seminar and she's sitting in the front row. It wasn't long after the Atlanta Olympics. And part of his speech, he said, no one remembers who comes second or third. It's all about coming first. And Natalie's still like running around with the bronze medal in her pocket. Oh, hi, I came third. <laughs> she really wanted, she really connected with him and she thought this guy could really help us, her and her other partner at the time, win a gold medal. And so she went up to him at the end of the seminar and she said, hi, my name's Natalie Cook. Um, you probably don't remember me, I came third at the Olympics. <laughs> I'd really like to work with you. Is there some chance we could get together and talk about it? And he said, yeah, that, that sounds like a good idea. And she straight away she said, oh, do you have a card or something? Um, I'll give you a call. And as they were shaking hands, he pulled her towards him and said, Natalie, if you want to make a change, if you want to do something, if you want to just hit it and get to the next level, do it now. Do it right now. Let's go and have a coffee as soon as I'm finished. She was like, oh, OK. <laughs> and that's what they did. They went away and they had a coffee, they got together, they talked about it, and he started working with her and her new partner. And all of a sudden, I was hearing all these stories about her doing all this fire walking and walking on broken glass and crazy stuff. And I thought, what's going on there? And then I watched her level of competition and her maturity and her confidence and everything just start to rise. And I thought, oh, I want to play with her again. She's looking good. So we decided to get back together again. 
Um, oh, sorry, there's my Atlanta Olympics picture after we beat the United States. We'll get past that. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out, sorry, I forgot this bit, was that sometimes it's easy to tell a story about a negative attitude, but it's also sometimes easy to show it visually. So for those of you who like to see this, and maybe you can use this when talking to your clients as well, this is how a negative attitude is sometimes perceived or driven through our bodies and our thoughts. We start off thinking about the worst possible result. We start off thinking about the bad results that we're having, right? You know, like we were in Atlanta. And what that does is give us negative thoughts. And then those negative thoughts become negative emotions, which create negative actions and behaviours which in turn create more negative results. Does that make sense? You see the cycle, and it's only because we start focusing on the bad stuff that's happening in our lives. Now, the switch that we made in Atlanta and the switch that you can make any time, you don't have to be in the gym and train to do this for hours and hours and hours, you can do this right now, is just start thinking positive thoughts. Like we said, use the inspiration because that'll create positive emotions which will create positive actions and behaviours which will create positive results and more positive thoughts. Does that make sense? It's just a cycle, but we can choose where to step into that cycle at any time. So I thought I'd just share that with you, and I love the way our success coach kind of pointed that out to me. It really made sense to me when I saw it like that, that I could actually choose to be focusing on results or start on my positive thoughts. Do you know there's a way of changing how you think into a positive thought, which is a physical thing? Can you think of one thing you could do physically that makes you smile and happy? Does anyone know what that is? Just an action? Apart from a smile, what, what could you do to make a smile? A real smile. Because we can all smile but not mean it. <laughs> Don't get that on video, it's probably really bad. Um, do you know, we, our kids do it. This. Skip. It seriously, it just makes you happy. Yeah, you're going, yep, it does. I do this for corporates. I say, next time you're feeling bad in the office, just start skipping. I bet you everyone will laugh. <laughs> that big man in a suit skipping through the office. Everyone will laugh and the whole situation will change. It's absolutely true. Skipping is one of the, the physical things that can make us feel that way. Anyway, here is our success coach in the middle, the man that I've been talking about, the actor, the crazy bald American dude, which I used to call him. You can't see his tats. He doesn't look too muscular there. Harry high pants, <laughs> nice shorts. But we decided after uh, we got back together again and I started working with Nat and Kurek, I thought, uh-oh, Kurek, his name is Kurek Ashley. I thought, uh-oh, I'm going to have to do the fire walking now. Mm -hmm. Scary. But you know how, e who's done a fire walk? Anyone done a fire walk? No? Oh, one. Oh, yeah, Rob. No? Only one person. You know how you do it? Do you not want to know the secret? It's this. No, it's just walk. It's just walk. But what stops us from doing it is in here. It's not a physical thing. So the fire walk is fantastic. If you ever get an opportunity to do something like that, it's fantastic to really challenge your thinking. It's about looking at something that's impossible, being afraid to do it. Like some people were in here this morning with Infusionsoft thinking, oh, that looks fantastic, but I don't know how to do it. You know, I'm not sure if I can manage that. Yeah, I'm sure there's thoughts of that going on all this weekend. Yeah, that's great, but maybe I can't do it. It's just a fear that we have in our head. So we look at something that's impossible and we just have the courage to take the first step. So buy the package or get on that coaching program or whatever it is, start walking through it and all of a sudden you're at the end and you look back and go, wow, how did I do that? That's not as crazy as I thought it was going to be. And so for us, we attached the fact that we had to try and beat the Brazilians because we thought in our head there was no way we could beat the Brazilians. They're the best team in the world. So we had to start doing things to challenge our way of thinking. And whenever you get the opportunity to step out of your comfort zone, do it. Whether it's public speaking or wearing a b bikini in public, which, by the way, I do bring... Believe it or not, some guys still say, oh, I thought you were coming in your uniform. <laughs> that never gets old, really. But I do like to point out, this was Athens, so in 2004. And then after this, because Sydney, the uniform was bigger. And it got smaller, and then smaller, and smaller. You know where the Olympics are going to be next year? Brazil. <laughs> 
this will be the back and there won't be a front. I'm, so, I'm kind of glad I'm not playing anymore. Um, but yes, yeah, standing in front of 10,000 people in a bikini, I'll tell you what, that's pretty scary. So we had to start doing things before the Olympics because we couldn't put ourselves in that sort of situation beforehand. We didn't know how to kind of get that experience. So we just kind of challenged ourselves and our thinking in different ways. We also worked, walked on broken glass. And that was scary for me because I've had about 10 stitches underneath my foot. I smashed a bottle once when I was young and it came up and it slashed under my foot and I had to have stitches. And, oh, the bottle, that was pretty awful. And then so looking at this broken glass going, I'm not going to walk on that. I need to use my feet. And then I did it and I'm like, oh, that was fine. Um, so, you know, it challenges, go for them. Try and push yourself out of your comfort zone. And that's what Keurig did for us. The guy on the left, another American. Steve Anderson, we found him on the beach in Northern California. Well, we didn't quite just pick him up. We actually let some of our volleyball friends know that we were looking for a coach. And they said, you know, we're, can I, you know, we asked, do you know any people? And we rang around and we thought, who can be our coach? And we got about six people put their hand up. And we basically had an interview with them by them giving us a coaching session. And at the end of our interview with Steve, we really liked his style. We thought, we're going to make him an offer. We said, OK, Steve, it's 1995. Come back to Australia with us. You know, pack up first. Come back to Australia with us. Give up your life here. When you're in Sydney, where I live, you can be in our spare room. When we're in Brisbane, where Natalie lived, you can stay with her parents. <laughs> and we'll pay you, wait for it, $500 a week. How does that sound? And he went, great, I'll do it. And we're like, oh my God, he said yes. So you know what? Don't be afraid to ask people for help. We all seem to want to do things ourselves and think, you know what, I'm not going to ask them. It's either going to be too expensive or this or that. Ask, because you never know. All you're going to get is a no, ask someone else. So we asked Steve, he said yes, he came on board and he ended up, he's only just left Australia, lived in Australia for 17 years. He now lives and he had, he's married and has a child and he now has gone to Canada and he's coaching the Canadian women's national beach volleyball team. So we changed his life by asking a simple question. So whose lives can you change by asking a question? And then the guy on the right, don't judge a book by its cover, but he was our personal trainer. <laughs> He doesn't quite look the part, I know. He was a little bit overweight then, but I tell you what, he knew his stuff. At 35, after four knee surgeries by that time, I had to make it to the Olympics. That was, that was really the big key for me, is to, to manage my workload and stave off the injuries so you know, I could make it through to Sydney. So we put together a team, after Natalie and I got back together again, an A team. So again, who's on your A-team? Who are the best people? If you want to achieve something, find someone who's done it. Obviously, you're in this community, which is fantastic. But when you go home and you're surrounded by the people in your town, who can you get on your A-team to get you to where you want to go? We decided to give ourselves a name because every good team has a name. Chicago Bulls, LA Lakers, can't think of any more. They're the two. Pardon? Perfect too, exactly. Um, so we gave ourselves a name and I actually made it up. I thought, oh, the dream team, that was a good name. And then in Australia, there was this, um, the, a quad of swimmers called the Mean Machine that won one year, the four by 100. So I thought, well, rather than reinvent the wheel, let's just do a bit of cut and paste. Dream team and the Mean Machine, let's be the dream machine. And I figured it was our dream to turn our bronze medal into a gold medal. So that became our team name. It was pretty cool. We did a lot of great stuff. We, apart from challenging ourselves with glass walking and fire walking, we also um, did blind rock climbing. <laughs> Crazy stuff. We did these campouts where we'd hide in the bush and our coaches would be like giggling. <laughs> men, under bushes with whistles and they'd be blowing a whistle and we'd have to try and find them in the dark and then, you know, all sorts of crazy fun team building stuff. We made it fun. But the best thing we did was this. Now, you're all going to get a copy of this in a moment, but I'll take you through it. This was our plan and this is what I believe was the secret to our success. The reason we called it our gold medal excellence plan was this, and this is, this is 
a big thing right here. The reason was is because when we went to Atlanta, our goal was to win a medal. What did we come out with? Bronze, the third medal. So we got a medal. So be careful what you wish for. But we had a chance there to go higher. Going into Sydney, when we sat down and said, what is our goal for Sydney? Our coaches asked us and we said, well, obviously it's gold. I said, hang on a minute. What happens if we don't quite get it? What if we get a silver or bronze? What can we go for that's more than a gold medal? And Natalie said, what about a platinum medal? It's more expensive than gold. And I went, yeah, I know, I know what you mean, but there's no such thing. So obviously, when you set your goals, goals go high. Go for something that actually is real. <laughs> so then we gave it a bit more thought. And what we ended up coming up with, what our goal was for the next couple of years, was to live our lives with gold medal excellence. And what that meant was that in 1998, we became Sydney 2000 Olympic gold medalists in 1998. Do you, know, do you want to know how we did that? Just by imagining we already were. So for the next two years, we acted like gold medalists. So think about what you want to achieve. Are you acting like you've already got it or are you still acting like you're struggling and you're tr climbing and you're going, oh, I'm almost there, but you're acting like you're almost there or are you acting like you're actually there? Are you acting like the type of person that already has that? And what I mean by that is the characteristics. So what we did is we actually looked around at the, the best athletes in the world. And we said, what are these athletes doing? What, what does a gold medalist live like? And we started to do that. One day we walked onto an aeroplane, last people walking onto the aeroplane. And Kirik was behind us and Natalie and I walked on. And as we walked on, he started clapping. It's 1999 or something like that. He started clapping. And he's going, welcome on board, Sydney 2000 Olympic gold medalist, Kerry Paras and Ali Cook. And some people started clapping. And then they went, what? Did he say 2000? And he completely embarrassed us, completely embarrassed us. But his point was so vital. Start acting like it now. Start getting used to being Sydney Olympic 2000 gold medalists. So what we did, we, we planned it out, and we put it in Olympic rings, and this went, went, went with us everywhere. It was very visual. We looked at all the different areas, and the first thing we looked at was our purpose, our why. Why are you here? Do you really know why? If you start peeling the, oh yeah, I want to you know, improve my, my results in my business. I want to have more business. I want to retain my business. Whatever that first reason is. Peel it back again like an onion. What's the next reason? What will that do for you? What will that mean to you? Oh, obviously it'd mean a little bit more money. Well, what will that mean to you? Well, maybe that'll give me some freedom. What are you going to do with that freedom? Well, obviously that will mean I can spend more time with my family. Ah, now we're finding out the real reason why you're here. So Keurig said to us, why do you want to win an Olympic gold medal? So we started to think, and we ended up writing this down, and we started to think of things like to have a better quality of life, to self-discovery, to become improved individuals because of our shared experience, to create new and better opportunities, to heighten our profiles, to greatly increase our income. Still waiting for that one. It actually started off to increase our income. And then we went, no, let's greatly increase our income. <laughs> let's push for higher. Um, just to have the satisfaction of accomplishing that goal. To become better at our craft. To make friends around the world. To do what we love and get paid for it. And then at the bottom, to enjoy the journey. We figured these were the reasons why we wanted to win a gold medal. This was so powerful back then. This was our motivation. When we lost matches, when we lost tournaments, when we started to fight, when we thought, what are we doing this for? Get a life, you know, things aren't going so well. We went back and had a look at this and we thought, you know what? This is why we're doing it. These are the reasons. So what are your whys? Has, who's ever done an exercise and written down why you want? Great. Half the room, great. Read that just like you read your goals. I'll tell you, it's great motivation. The other one on there which I wanted to point out was uh, inspire and lift others. Is that on there? Yeah. Inspire and lift others' hopes and dreams. Where is that? Our purpose is. Oh, yeah, there it is. Yep, to inspire and lift others' hopes and dreams. So back then we were already visualising and thinking that Natalie and I would be walking around on stages talking about what we did to win a gold medal. 
that was one of the reasons why I won it. And look, here I am. So that was pretty powerful. The, the yellow one, code of conduct, that was basically the rules that we needed to abide by, our rules, that meant that if we do this, we will win a gold medal. We just have to do this. So things like respect others and their opinions, use deeds rather than words. It was really important because there were no substitutes. It was just Natalie and I out in the court. We had to really support each other. So whether you're in a small business or a big business, do you empower your staff? Think about it. Do you give them stuff to make them feel good? Or do you disempower your staff? Do you say things that take the power away from them? And even in relationships, when you left home to come here, did you say something when you left to your partner that was empowering? Or did you do something that left them with, hmm. Think about that. It was really important for us. We thought if we gave each other empowering communication, that would keep us at our best the entire time. Do whatever it takes. Be responsible for, oh, we said that. Be compassionate and understanding. Be committed to constant daily improvement. Keurig was so committed to that that he had a tattoo on his wrist that he obviously could look at a thousand times a day. And it was, uh, uh, it was just letters, C-A-N-I, constant and never-ending improvement. He reminded himself every single day, what can I improve on today? What can you improve on today? Can you be a better listener? Can you take more notes? Can you feed your body better today? Forget the muffins and get some fruit? Like, what is it you can do better today? If you can just constantly, every day, think of that, imagine in 100 days you could be 100% better if it's just a little tiny 1%. So we realised if we did that, we would be able to win a gold medal. Stay focused almost at the bottom, have fun and enjoy the journey. That was a rule. We figured that if we wanted to do this, it was a rule that we would have fun. The green circle was all volleyball, all about volleyball. If you guys know anything about volleyball, the first one, intimidate with champions physiology. I mean, this is good for trainers. If you walk out there and you know, you're about to train someone, you're going, oh, howdy, I'm really tired. But you, you know, you've got to work really hard for me today. If you walk out there with that sort of attitude, it's not going to work for you, is it? So for us, if we walked out on the court and went, Ooh, don't serve me, serve the ball to her, I'm really scared. So we had to just walk out there with our shoulders back and, or act like we were gold medalists. We had to look and act like we were gold medalists. We figured that would help us win the game. The other thing I point out on there is touch everything. That was one of the things that I thought I had to do because that meant the ball, by the way, we do tour around with the men's competition, which is quite nice, quite handy. But it, was, it meant the ball. And I just want to paint this picture of being in Brazil, in Rio next year. This is what the athletes are going to go through. Because in Rio, you know it's like, OK, here's going to be my conversion rates. 38 degrees is about 100 and something. OK, it's over 100 in Brazil. We normally stay across from the beach in a hotel. So you're in air conditioning like this. You walk outside, it's like, Phew. It's like walking into a sauna. And then by the time you cross the road and you get to the beach, you're starting to just, little droplets are starting to come out on your face. You're starting to feel a bit sweaty. Then you start warming up and those droplets become, you know, dripping sweat and you're really getting into your warm up now. You're just in your bikini. And um, all of a sudden there's a ball that's about to land and it's about, I don't know, 10 feet away. And you know you're gonna to have to launch yourself at it and probably hit the ground to keep that off the ground, right? So by this time, your body is wet, like completely wet with sweat. Because you put your sunscreen on before you left the hotel. Just, it's just pouring out. But you, you've committed to touch everything. And you go for that ball, and you lift it out, and you keep it out of the sand, and you get up, and you're like a schnitzel. <laughs> a crumbed schnitzel. And the sunscreen, for those people who make schnitzels themselves, is like the egg. It keeps it, it lets it stick and it stays on you. So for me, that was me because secret is I hate sand. <laughs> Go figure, I hate sand. I bet you there's part of your job that you hate as well, right? Is there a part of your job that you hate doing, like with a passion? I'm sure there is. But if you have a strong enough goal and a strong enough why, you can get past those little niggly things. So whatever, I get home from the beach and I get every grain of sand off me. <laughs> that was cool. So 
The green one was all about volleyball. The red one, they were our characteristics. That was who we had to become. So we had to say to ourselves, what do we have to be like? Do we have to be strong in emotion and spirit. We have to be positive and certain. We have to be in the ready. We have to be perceptive, flexible, outcome driven, respectful of ourselves and our opponents, etc., etc. If we did everything on that page, everything on those circles, do you think that we would have won an Olympic gold medal? I mean, you know the answer. But we figured that if we did everything there, if we acted like we were already gold medalists, if we lived our lives with gold medal excellence, we would win a gold medal. Because when you're standing there in the grand final, in the final for gold, it's not the time to go, right, now's the time we're going to be acting like and playing like a gold medalist. You want to have done that months and years beforehand so when you get there, it's just normal. And that is how I explain it was for us on that day. It was normal. It was like any other day. We did this every day. We played like that every day. But it took a process. Does that make sense? Gold medal excellence. And, and you know, I teach this to the, the volleyball players and other athletes that I work with now because I get them to be who they want to be now. Don't wait for next year or next month or whenever it's going to happen. Do it now. And the, the, uh, the purpose behind it for our coach, and he was way ahead of his time as a sports coach, he knew that we would win a gold medal. He just knew it. What he was really concerned about was the people that we would become in the process. And I just cannot thank him enough for that because I've become such a different person in that process. So if you think about who you have to become to achieve what you want to be, I can guarantee you, you'll get it or you'll get damn close to that. Does that make sense? Yeah, cool. How can we make it better became our slogan. So whenever something bad happened, we just looked at each other and went, right, let's move on. How can we make this better? It's like driving a car. You don't drive a car staring at the rear vision mirror, do you? You're going to crash. You look out the front windscreen. So we had such great leadership and, of course, Oh, the other thing is we surrounded ourselves with what we wanted, so we surrounded ourselves with gold. Now, this might not mean so much to you, but we had palm olive gold soap. We had Colgate gold toothpaste. That year, Foster's... Oh, I hate Foster's. Don't drink Foster's. Please don't tell me you drink Foster's. Foster's beer made three cans, bronze, silver, and gold. We, we got a slab... They call them a slab. And we chucked away the bronze and silver cans and we kept the gold cans. Isn't that cool? And we had them in our room. There's the box and the cans on top. <laughs> we collected everything gold. It was kind of a joke, but Kirik said to us, if you want something in your life, start surrounding yourself with it. If you want a car, you've got to have a garage and a license, right? Think about what you want and start surrounding yourself with it. Natalie had a, she was starting to do some property development. She had a monopoly board. And she stuck that on the wall. You, you call it Monopoly, right, here as well. Same game. And um, she had a Monopoly board and she stuck it on the wall and she changed the name of some of the streets to the names where she was looking at investing. <laughs> That's cool, isn't it? She had gold sheets. She really took this one like, way down the track. She had gold satin sheets. She had gold boxer shorts that she would sleep in at night. She had a gold necklace. I, had, I saved a gold Easter egg from Easter that year, like gold foiled egg, and took it into the, the accommodation that we stayed in, the village. And this was our wall in the village where we stayed. We actually didn't stay in the village. We stayed outside of it. But this was our wall in the accommodation. You see our gold medal excellence plan. We had some motivational quotes. Natalie had a picture. You can't see it, but that's Michael Jordan there up in the top right-hand corner. And we just surrounded ourselves with inspiration. We also had, on the left there, is a scoreboard. This was weeks before the Games. This is where we stayed. We had a scoreboard. How many Olympic athletes would have a scoreboard that they made up in their room? I doubt whether there would have been many, if any. But we had our names and we had the amount of points that we had to make that day in the game. It didn't matter who we were playing. It was just what we had to do. So you can see how the vision that we had created around this whole thing is starting to build. Does, can you see that? It wasn't just let's try and go to the Olympics, play, oh, we won. There was so much more behind it. And it was fun and it was funky and, you know, it was just, it was always different. We also didn't stay in the village. We stayed in a Catholic nunnery. 
Can you believe that? There wasn't enough room at Homebush where we had the Olympic venue, and so we stayed near Bondi Beach in this little nunnery with the cyclists, because they had their event out there. The Olympic Committee kind of took it over, but the nuns would line the driveway. This was them. I took this picture out of the bus. They would line the driveway every day and wave us off to, to Bondi and say, good luck today, girls, their little Aussie flags. And I'm sure they prayed for us. Look, she's praying already in the front. <laughs> So it was pretty cool. And then finally, the dream became reality. And um, I'm sure you've been waiting for me to pull this one out. Yeah. And there's the real one, the real shiny one. Thank you. I have been handing this out for the last 15 years. Just last week, you're the first group that's seen this, I had it resurfaced and I had a new ribbon put on because Natalie had it done about two months ago and I put my medal next to her medal at a function a few weeks ago and went, oh my God, my medal's filthy. It was filthy. And I thought, oh, I've got to get it done. So I had it resurfaced. So I'm going to hand this out. Before I do, who wants to experience what it's like to stand on a podium and have a medal put around their neck? Oh, okay, sir, you put your hand up first, I think. Yes, you in the beautiful blue shirt. Yeah. What's your name? Mike. Mike. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Yeah, it's like someone giving you a high five and then turning around, not shaking hand. All right, Mike. I'm not going to embarrass you or anything. I'm going to get you to stand on him. <laughs> All right. I'm going to get you to stand up here. Stand up yeah, here. Yeah, be careful. You've got good balance. Oh, well. Okay. Wow. I want to ask you first, yes, doesn't he look good? Mike, what are you really good at? What are you awesome at? What am I really good at? Um, Just name one thing you're really awesome at. Um, Come on, there must be something. Help him out. Um, Anyone know? Pardon? Running a business. All right, high five, running a business. Okay, I'm going to put this around Mike's neck, and when I do, I want you guys to go absolutely nuts. Can you do that? Can you do that for Mike? All right. What's your last name? Tedesco. Mike Tedesco. Mike Tedesco, gold medal winner of running a business! Woo! <laughs> yeah! Woo, 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 woo Oh my God. Yeah, okay. How did that feel? Unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> Times that by about 10,000, and that's what it's like to win a gold medal. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Good oh, work. Okay. You're a good sport. Well done. Here, you can keep that and show it around to your friends. Oh, wow. And don't that's bite awesome. it, Mike. It is real gold. <laughs> <laughs> so what do Olympic gold medalists do after they win an Olympic gold medal? Well, if they're anything like me, they become a serial entrepreneur pretty much a serial entrepreneur. I didn't want to go back to work. So over the last few years, I've found everything I could possibly do to earn an income. Obviously speaking, it's been fantastic. But I've also coached beach volleyball athletes. I'm going to be mentoring in June in Korea for three weeks at the, the World University Games, 200 Australian athletes and me. <laughs> I'm going to be the peak performance mentor. That's my official title. And I'm going to be there with these athletes, and I'm hopefully going to be able to help them through what they're going to be going through. So that's going to be cool. I've written a book, The Business of Being an Athlete, which I believe all, if not some of you, will be receiving today, which is fantastic. And I just want to say that there is someone else in this room that also wants to write a book. So I'm going to put him on the spot, and I'm going to ask him when that book is coming out. Kevin? All right, let's give him a clap. September of next year. He put a date on it. Ha. I asked Kevin last night, what are you doing these days? And he said, oh, I'm looking for a new project, da 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 da. And he just happened to mention, I'd like to write a book. And since then, now he's put a date on it. Have you got a title yet? You'll have to think that one up too. But you know what? You've got to put it out there. You've just got to put it out there. Put your goals out there. Who knows? Someone here might come up to Kevin later and go, I'm going to buy your first 100 books because you know so much. If you don't know Kevin, go and ask what he's done. He's got an amazing background. Um, and the other thing you probably realised I do is I'm standing out there by an isogenic stand. So what is an Olympic gold medalist doing with isogenics, you might ask? Well, about two years ago, I started to think, wow, 
I've had a great career in speaking. This has been really awesome. But I started to think, what happens when the phone stops ringing? What happens when people stop wanting me to stand up here and pay me to do this? I have a house with a big mortgage in Sydney, one of the most expensive cities in the world. I have a nine-year-old son that I'd like to choose which school he's going to. My husband has his own business. Who knows where that's going? As you know, it could go this way or it could go this way. And I was starting to lie awake at night and seriously worry about our future. You know, we had, I was doing well, but I'm thinking, you know, I'm nearing 50 and I just didn't know where the future was. I didn't have any security. And someone started knocking on my door and that was Natalie Cook, my beach volleyball partner. She said, you've got to have a look at this business opportunity, Net network marketing. Isogenix, it's a great health and wellness product. Try it. So I tried it. Within 30 days, I lost five kilos. Great, I'd put on a little bit of retirement weight <laughs> over the last 10 years, and it dropped off me very quickly. I became healthier and happier than I'd been for a long time. And then I started looking at the business opportunity. So the reason I'm here is because I think this could be a great business opportunity for you guys. Who already uses Isogenix and recommends it to their clients? Oh, one, two, three, four. So these guys obviously are great examples. So there's still a lot of opportunity here to do that. I was given this box. Then the products come in this box. They land on your doorstep and you go, whoa, Christmas. And you open this box and it's full of all these great products. But it wasn't about the products. The products just speak for themselves. Fantastic. I've had them looked at by my nutritionist friends. They're awesome. What comes in this box is an amazing opportunity. And for me, it was the opportunity of creating security for my future. And it's also given me something else. My husband did the 30-day cleanse, and it's given me the guy on the right. All right. <laughs> I challenged him. I actually said to him on the left, he's OK looking on the left, isn't he? I challenged him, and I said, because he had this men's health magazine, and he said, I want to look like the cover of that. And I went, really? Do you? I don't know if you could do that, Max. <laughs> and as soon as I said to him, I don't think you could do it, that was it. That's all he wanted to hear. And he went and did it. He actually looks even more amazing. He's 46. He looks even more incredible. And you know what it's done? It's not just, that's not what the products do. It's actually also made him just become more motivated to train because he feels so much healthier. So if you're interested at all, I am building a new team, a new gold medal team. And I'm looking for partners in my team, and I'd love to chat with you outside. Um, I'm going to be here for the rest of the, today and tonight, so I'd love to meet you all. So please come up and say hi. Anyway, I'll still say hi to you. Have a photo with the medal. And thank you very much, and all the very best of luck with your futures, and I hope to meet you all again soon. Thank you so much.